morning. First, I do want to thank everybody for being here and also thank the organizers for inviting me. This is quite an opportunity. It's, it's wonderful to go to different kind of meetings and talk to different type of people because you see a complete different way of looking at things, which is really quite nice. Okay, what I would like to do today is talk a little bit about climate change in general and species. And um, what I first want to do is talk about our rapidly warming world. Um, I give so many talks on global warming that and in audiences where they don't really believe that the, the globe is warming. So I'm going to go through a little bit of that. I'm going to talk a little bit about how species actually adapt to that warming. And then what happens when the species actually don't adapt. So on to rapidly warming. Um, this is some of the evidence that is just uh, very prevalent around the world. With the glaciers that are melting, I could show slide after slide after slide of the glaciers melting. That's 1928, that's 2004. This is actually one of the slides that I showed in the IPCC when we were having a lot of trouble getting people to accept the fact that the globe was warming, well, getting the delegates to accept that. And so finally somebody stood up from the floor and said, if we warmed the earth and the ice didn't melt, then we'd have something to argue about. <laughs> but this is what's going on. Also, we know what's going on with Greenland. It's, it's melting. The other thing that we have to realize is that as the ice is melting, we are losing a lot of information about our past history. So we have colleagues now that are going out and drilling and trying to um, take cores of this, this ice so that we do understand what's going went on in the past. But as it's melting, it's going away. This is basically why it is happening. These are just plots showing uh, the uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide, which is here. And then we have methane, which is here. And we have um, nitrous oxide, which is there. And this is all for sure going on. This is all due to people. We have no doubt about that whatsoever. And this is basically what it's causing is the globe to warm. This goes on the x-axis is, is year. It goes from 1860 basically up to today. And you can see that there has been quite a change that has happened. And the other thing that has happened too that is also indicating that we are warming is, is that the sea level is going up. Because as the water uh, gets warmer, it expands and so it, it rises in addition to the ice melting, but this is primarily due to the expansion of water. So yes, indeed, Virginia, <laughs> there is global warming. Um, and actually, the North Pole is starting to look just exactly like that. So we do know also that a large part of that has to do with, with people. And what I'm showing here is we have the different continents, North America, South America, Africa, on and on. The black line is the actual temperature, average temperature of that continent from 1900 to 2000 and a bit. And what is being shown now is in the, the, the blue down on the bottom is what our models are predicting to be what the temperature should be if we only put in natural forcings. Natural forcings are things like volcanoes, sunspots, that type of thing. And you can see that it, it follows a little bit at the very beginning, but then there's a real divergence that's going on between the blue and the black, the blue um, stripes and the black line. But now if what we do is we put into our models the information about both human sources and natural sources, what we find is there is a very good agreement that is going on. And you can see that's true for all of these various continents. So this is showing us, and there's other evidence. Um, I've done a study looking at how species are responding to temperature. And they are telling us also that humans are affecting the, the temperature that they are um, adjusting to on a very regional scale. So this is saying that, yes, indeed, that we are causing a big part of that. Now, that actually can be good news. Because if we're causing it, then maybe we can actually go in and change it. And I do believe that very strongly, that we can. We just now have to figure out how to do that. 
okay, there. Okay, so now this gets into what do we do in the future? On the x-axis again is time, and it goes from um, around 2000 out to 2100, and yeah, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm standing right in the way for you guys to see this, the slides, but I don't know what to do about it, so sorry. Um, anyway, we have year on the bottom and we have CO2 emissions going on the, the y-axis. And then we have all these different types of scenarios, and these come from the IPCC, and what they are are different ways of of assuming how many people we have, what the affluence is, what the technology is, what the cooperation competition is, that type of thing. And so we have all these various, um, various scenarios. And A1FI is, uh, FI stands for fossil intensive. And a lot of people are saying that that is basically business as usual. Um, what we're doing right now, if we continue to do that, this is what is projected to be our CO2 emissions. Um, we uh, actually are above this line right now. Um, we're higher than what we had expected. But this is what, if we have base, um, uh, if we continue just like we are, that's where we could be. If we are very lucky, um, we could do something down in here. That would mean that we would have a lot more technology, we'd have a lot more cooperation going on, that type of thing. Um, so, how do you get this across? This is what I call my wheel of misfortune. And what I'm trying to do is get across to people that, that we have a lot of variability. We don't really know what the outcome is going to be, but we can bound that outcome. So, if we have no policy, if we continue as business as usual, we have a small chance of keeping the, the temperature below one degree Celsius, I don't believe that's going to happen, but there's a very small chance. Then from 1 to 1.5 on up, and you can see that these are now getting larger, and that means that you have a higher probability of actually the ball falling into that, that place, showing that there is this, this, this understanding of what's happening, but we don't know where the ball is going to fall. The thing that concerns me the most is when you start looking up here into this, this area, and if we're very, very unlucky, we could go to 4 to 5 degrees C above global average, temperature and we could even go higher than five degrees. And if we go higher than five degrees, I, I guarantee you that's gonna be quite a disaster for species on the planet and since species are very important to our survival, we need to actually be thinking about that aspect too. So this is with no policy. Now, what happens if we put in a policy with lower CO2? This will widen these, these quote unquote good slots will widen and even the bad slots Will, will physically go away. So we need to have some kind of lowering of CO2 to try and help us to, to not go as high as greater than five degrees C. Okay, so what actually is going on here? What we have is if you have this distribution here, what this is is saying this is cold down this edge, it, right in the middle is average and up here is hot, and this is probability of occurrence. So if this is where our old previous climate was here, what we are basically doing is shifting that whole climate um, distribution this way. So now instead of having the mean be here, the mean is up here. And now we have actually, we have less cold weather than we did before because the, the, the um, distribution has shifted over. We have a lot more what we consider hot weather and we have a zillion more hot weather events that we haven't, records that we haven't, haven't had before, again, because we're shifting this over. And what we're really needing to figure out is how far we're going to be shifting this. Okay, now the other thing is, is what could happen in the future. This is the one that scares me personally the most. This is the ocean acidification. This is fairly new out. Um, when I was in the last IPCC, I was able to get about a paragraph in on ocean acidification, but since the IPCC um, only does um, analysis or, or assessment of what the literature is, we can't do any new, new um, research. We have to look at what's already out there. There wasn't that much out there, but we had to get something in because it's, it's just starting now. And what we have found is, again, on the, the x-axis is year, on the y-axis is ocean acidification, so that's the pH. 
And this line here is basically where we are right now. It has the, the, the um, blue lines are basically the variability depending upon season in the ocean, and the red line is the average. We have already noticeably um, decreased the, the, the um, pH. We are, we are acidifying the ocean. Now, why would we be worried about acidifying the ocean? Well, because what it does is it can start eroding the structures that the corals are made out of. It can start eroding the shells that make the clams, you know, so you're going to have naked clams. Um, I don't think that's true, but anyway, you'll have, <laughs> you'll, it, it's going to be a, a big effect. So anything that is using calcium can be affected by this greatly, even all the fishes. And since about 35% of the human population lives around the um, sea area and they use the ocean for their livelihood, we really are going to have a lot of trouble with, um, with people in, in this situation because we're going to be losing fish, we're going to be losing coral reefs and the like. Okay, now to show that we're not just talking about species here, we also are talking about our food crops. This is the x, the y-axis is change in yield, and the x-axis is actually up here, degree C. So we're getting we're getting hotter as we go this way. As we get hotter, the rice crops in the tropics are going to drop. The the yield will. The corn yield will also drop. And now that's in the tropics. Now if we start looking at the temperate areas, the same thing now is happening. We have the corn in the temperate, corn crops in the temperate areas dropping down. And also we have wheat, oops, wheat that are dropping down like that too. Now the other thing too that we need to think about is how do wild species interact with our crops? And a lot of our crops are actually pollinated by wild species. And if we start having this changing going on with the species, it could greatly affect our crop yields also. Okay, so what I want to do now is just go through what the last IPC said. This is just a, a very um, easy, hopefully easy um, recap of what the, the, AR, the um, assessment report number four is showing. And what it is doing is, oh, wrong one. Okay, this side is is temperatures in degree C. This side is estimated what the years will be. That's, it completely depends upon what scenario are you are on. So that may not actually be the case. Um, but what we have done is we have gone up by 0.7 degrees C thus far. And what that has caused is a decrease in water, increase in droughts, increase of fire risks, and increase of floods and various storms. Now, if we go up above one, one degree C here, but below two, what could be going on? We're going to have an increase in the risk of extinction. And we could lose about, well, what we could do would be have 20 to 30 percent of the known species in the world marked for extinction. And the known species, we have about 1.7 to 1.9 million known species in the world. We have between 3 million and, and 10 million actual species in the world. But if we're going to lose if we could possibly lose tw even just 20% of the known species, 20% of 1.7 million is a lot of species. So what we're doing right now is we're standing right at the brink of a mass extinction event. It's very similar to what happened with the dinosaurs. Instead of with the dinosaurs having the asteroid causing it all, there's one species who's causing this, and that species is us. And I think we need to be thinking about that. Okay, also if we go up, we're going to have, um, most of the corals are going to be bleached and we're going to have an increase in floods and droughts. If we go up more, we're going to have major changes in the natural systems, biodiversity is going to drop, and now cor coral mortality will occur. Now, remember, this does not figure in the acidification of the ocean, so that may occur, uh, occur sooner. If we go up again, what we have is about 30% of the wetlands on the world, around the world are, are going to be lost, and we're going to have very significant decrease in the food, food production globally. Then if we get up above four, and let's really hope we don't get up above four, we, have, we could have greater than 40% of the known species, again, slated for extinction. And so this is again telling us how close we are standing to the edge of this 
of this mass extinction. Um, partial melting of the ice sheets, actually, that now needs to be moved down here because that's happening. Um, and then we're going to have an increase in, in sea level, or could have an increase in sea level of quite a bit. And that is quite a bit, and that will actually affect an awful lot of people that are living around the edges of the, of the continents. Okay, so that tells you a little bit about our rapidly warming world and how it is affected. Now, let's talk a little bit about species. Um, I'm a biologist, and so my primary role in all of this and in the IPCC has been to try and figure out how species, plants and animals, are being affected by climate change. And so let's go through a little bit of that and how the, how the species are actually adapting. The primary ways that they're changing is, is they're changing their ranges. The, the range is where a species actually, the area that it covers of where it, where it occurs, and those ranges now are shifting, they're changing. Phenology shifts, by phenology I mean changes in time, and so um, our, all of our daffodils are coming up earlier in the spring than they used to. That's a phenological shift. Um, birds are migrating back earlier, that's also a phenology shift. And then we have other kind of shifts, and that's just a catch-all to remind me to say there's also genetic changes, there's behavioral changes um, in, in birds, there's um, morph morphological changes that are going on, but a lot of those have, there's not that much information out there right now yet about those. So let's first talk about the range shifts and the phenological shifts. But before I do that, this is a, this has not, this, this slide has nothing at all to do with global climate change. It's just my way of trying to help, help understand how species interact with each other. And what this is, is down here on the x-axis is year, on the y-axis is what, relative abundance, and this is of a canine group, and it includes the wolves, the foxes, and the red, sorry, wolves, coyotes, and the red foxes. And in 1860, around in here, there was a very um, interesting association between the three of them. The wolves were the most abundant, and then the others were lower. Now, we decided that we really wanted to get rid of the wolves, and we did a really good job. So we smooshed down the wolves, and then a complete surprise happened. Up popped the coyotes. We didn't expect that. Okay, so we lived with the coyotes for a while. Then we decided we wanted to get rid of the coyotes. So again, purposefully, we smooshed down the coyotes and up popped the red foxes. Now, the only reason that I know of this study is because I, I um, work on birds, and there was a a woman who was working on dabbling ducks, and we spend a lot of our money um, trying to increase the population of dabbling ducks, and we haven't had a lot of success. And what she has found is, is that one of the main reasons we're not having success is because of the red foxes. The red fox will go in and plop itself down on the nest and break all the eggs and eat what's there, and then leave. A coyote, if a coyote finds a dabbling, desk, dabbling duck nest, <laughs> that's hard to say, they will go in and take one egg, and then leave and eat it. And then maybe it'll get distracted and go do something else. The whole nest isn't destroyed. And then if we have wolves, well, wolves aren't interested at all in dabbling duck eggs. So what this woman said was her recommendation is we need to reintroduce coyotes. Into, <laughs> I didn't think that was going to happen. But the point that I'm making here is, is that even when even when we're making a change, we're pushing a system, an ecological system, in a way that we are purposely pushing it, there are surprises happening that we didn't expect at all. Now what we are doing is we are pushing basically all of the species around the globe, and what is happening is surprises are going to happen. And we need to be aware of some of those surprises because they could vary easily affect humans and will be affecting humans um, directly and also indirectly. So this is just showing you how, how, um, how attuned they are to each other. So now let's go on and talk a little bit about range shifts. The ranges have been shifting up in elevation and they've also been shifting poleward. So up here they're going north, down south they're going south. Now, why is that happening? Well, as it gets warmer, what they're, they're able to do is shift into that region. Or as the, as the mountains are getting warmer, they're able to shift up on that region. So 
This is just an example. This, is a, a, this was a slide that was done by a graduate student of mine in 1995, so it's a little bit old. But what he did was he looked at this Baltimore Oriole, and he looked at the present range of the Baltimore Oriole, and he modeled it using different um, climate um, equations. So how important was temperature, how important was precipitation, number of days cold, number of days warm, that type of thing. He came up with a way to model the actual um, distribution at the time. Then what he did was he put, he used a, a, a model and he said, if we put double CO2 into that model, where are all of those different um, climate variables going to be? And that's where I can say the, uh, the, this bird could be. So what happens is, is that the, all of those are up here. So it has moved, moved polar just as we had expected. Now, this really can't be true because we have no idea what the um, habitat is under there. It may not be the proper habitat for it. But all that being the same, if we're just looking at the climate variables, it is going to shift. Now, this is a slide that, that, that Al Gore used to carry around, carry around blah, sorry, that Al Gore used to carry around in his shirt pocket, literally, as a slide, because he would put it on to show people. This was in the olden days when we had, didn't have PowerPoint. Um, but what we would, he would do would be he would show this because he felt as though it was a visceral response for people. Because if we have double CO2, which I don't see, I think there's a very low probability that we won't hit it. I think we're going to hit double CO2. Um, guess what? No Baltimore Orioles in Baltimore. So that caused quite a stir and people were concerned. So again, what we need to do is we need to get people in, involved in this and understand why it's so important and go, go from there. Okay, now this is just a, a representation um, to show, again, the association of species. If we have two species, species A and species B, and I don't really care what they are, um, with warming, these two species are not going to go shift like this and shift down. Darwin said, when we have a community, they'll all shift together no matter what happens. They'll always stay together. Well, they don't quite dance that way. What happens is, is that all of the different species have different responses to these environmental factors. So you have one species that's going this way, one species going this way, and one species is staying the same. So there's all this disruption going on. The trouble with that disruption is, is that if we have a very um, balanced predator-prey interaction, now what could happen? Well, in that situation, so A moved and B didn't. Now, if B happens to be an endangered species, and we've been spending a lot of money trying to get the endangered species up in abundance, but finally its predator moved out of the way, its abundance is going to go up. And that could be a good thing. But now, what if this species B is a pest on one of our crops, and species A is one or two species that actually feeds on those pests. Now, that could be a problem. Now, people will oftentimes say, yeah, 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 Terry, that's true, but there's gonna be, there's gonna be species down here that are gonna move up into that area. And that's true, but it does take species a while to really become specialized on a prey. And during that time period, it could be um, very detrimental to our, to our agriculture. So what I'm saying is this type of interaction, when we're having this separating, this tearing apart of communities, um, we could actually, it could actually be good or it could be bad. And so I'm not saying that everything that's going on with global warming is bad, but what I am saying is, is that there is the potential that way. So we all talk about polar bears, I love this. The bad news is the ice cap is, mel ice cap is melting and it's going to be almost impossible to catch seals. The good news is if we keep moving south, there's tons of fat animals called humans who can't run very fast. So now, <laughs> this doesn't quite work because they're going equatorward, if that's a, yeah, they're going towards the equator instead of up towards the pole, but it gets the, the point across. The, actually, the other thing I love about this, you see, 
the map is called the map of meat. So, so but, but we are having this moving around of, of species. Um, polar bears will not come down, but anyway, it, it, it makes the point. So now, let's talk a little bit about phenological shifting. And again, this has to do with changing in time. On the x-axis again, we have time. On the y-axis is the day of first arrival. So the first time that a sandhill crane was seen in whatever year that is was that date. So the next year, the first time it was seen in that year, it was this date. We plotted all of those out. And what we have been finding is this very, very strong trend toward species doing things earlier in the spring and species doing things later in the fall. So what, we, what I wanted to do was I wanted to see if this is global warming, then species all around the globe should be showing this same type of trend. We should be seeing what's going on here. Well, what I, I couldn't find enough information about the southern hemisphere, so I just looked at the northern hemisphere. And I did this a huge meta-analysis on spring phenology. I had 61 studies that actually were looking at spring phenology. And that was a, almost 700 species. Now, some of those species did not show trends. But this is the overall result. On this axis is the number of days changed in a decade. So, and the minus means that it's coming earlier. So this species was coming 24 days earlier in the end of the study, which was in around um, 2000, compared to the beginning of the study, which was around 1960. So there was quite a switch. So this is 24 days per decade in that time period. That's a huge change. And this is just number of species that are showing that change. And now you can see that it's all pushed over. The x is for zero, showing no change because I didn't feel as though if something is not changing, um, it really is not telling us anything about what we're trying to study. And I'll be happy to talk to you about that later if you want me to. But what's happening is all the species are smushing this direction. So they're, they're coming earlier. Now, there's a smattering of ones that are coming later, but the vast majority are this side. If you take the mean, that's what this arrow is showing, including all of these species, but not including those that are not changing, the mean is about five days per decade over the last 30 to 40 years. So it's, it's quite a change that is happening. OK, so we've talked a little bit about rain shifts. We talked a little bit about phenology. And we've, now, as far as other shifts, there are changes in genetics already being seen. Changes in behavior is, are, is very, very strong. Um, but those are the, the primary changes that have been happening. Except, oh, what I wanted to do here, sorry. What I wanted to do here was tell you again about another global uh, um, analysis that I did. This time, northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, looking at all of this, the different species that were showing change, all of those changes that were on the previous slide. And I came up with 143 studies. This was all before um, the third assessment report for the, the IPCC. And we had almost 1,500 plant and animal species that were showing change. And I wanted to see, are those species changing in the way that I would expect with global warming, or are they changing opposite? Now, the way I would expect is they would be going poleward, they would be going up in elevation, right? or they're coming earlier in the spring or later in the fall, or they're changing genetics in a way that would be expected, that type of thing. And what I found was for basically the 1,500 species that changed, 20% of them changed in a way that was opposite from what I would expect. That meant that 80% were changing in the direction that I would expect. Now, if I stood here and I flipped a coin 100 times and it came up heads, 80 times, I think everybody here would say that's a weighted coin. That's really what the species are doing. They are telling us that we're waiting. We are actually forcing them to, to change. There's something that's going on there. So it's not, not just the temperature changing, but, but the nat nature is changing also. OK, so now let's talk about what happens when species cannot adapt. And by that, I mean they can't move up uh, towards the pole, they can't change their timing, that type of thing. What happens? Extinction. That's basically what is going on. 
The examples that I want to go over today are range shifts in the disruption of biotic interactions like I talked about before, and then synergistic effects. Now, let's talk a little bit about range shifts. If you're a species and you live on a mountain and you're moving up, that's great. You have space to, to move up. Sorry. But what happens if you already live up here at the top of the mountain? You don't have any place to go but extinct. Unless people go and, I like to say, pick up a U-Haul trailer and, and pick up all these species in their habitats and move them someplace else and, and put them, reintroduce or introduce them and make sure that they survive and on and on and on, then that will be fine. But if not, they're what we called functionally extinct. They're not extinct yet, but unless humans do something dramatic to change what they're, where they're living, um, or to change, well, to change where they're living, they're not going to make it. They truly are going to go extinct. So let me give you an example of the pika, which is a, a member of the rabbit family. Um, Joseph Grinnell in 1900 found that the pika went as far up in the Sierras, Sierra Nevadas, as 7,800 feet. Now in the exact same locations, because we have his, his data, we now know that in 2004, the pika had moved up to 9,500 feet. The problem is, it can't move much more because it has to have these big rock, oh, bummer. Okay, <laughs> we, we, the, I think the pika is gonna go extinct. Um, to say the, the result before I was ready. They have to have these great big rocks to live in. And even though there's area still for it to move up the mountain, it can't move because it doesn't have the rocks, so it's going to go extinct. And I am very, well, I, I would be very surprised if the pika does not go extinct. Now, I don't know if any of you know about the Sky Islands in New Mexico and Arizona. I grew up in New Mexico, and so these are a place that are very near and dear to my heart. But you know, it, it, think about the John Wayne movies where we had the desert like this, and then all of a sudden there was a mountain that came straight up. Well, there's a lot of species, a lot of species that live on on those areas. And this is just a slide showing the threatened, endangered, and sensitive species in Southwest National Forests. And all the forests are down here. Um, I don't care what they are, they're just a different color. But the point is, is that the forests that are associated with the Sky Islands, look at how many threatened, endangered, and sensitive species they have. This study came out in around 2000. And now what's happening is there, there are even more and these species, because they live up on these sky islands that are flat on top, again, they have no place to go, so they too are functionally extinct. Now, can we save them? Yes, we could. Um, I went and I saw a, a panel one time about, about frogs and toads in, in North America. We have 301 frogs and toads. I didn't know that, but I do now. And each of the different zoos in Aquaria are taking three. And in this panel, they went through and they talked about how much infrastructure they needed, how much money they needed, how much food they needed, how, much, how, how their public didn't really care that they had these, you know, on and on and on. This is to save three frogs. We're now talking about at least 20% of the known species in the world. We're not going to be able to do it. So we really are going to have a mass extinction. Okay, so disrupting biotic interactions, this is similar to what we were talking about with the, the canine group, the wolves and the, and the um, coyotes and red foxes. And this is where I think the polar bear comes in. I truly don't believe the polar bear will go extinct. How many zoos have polar bears? A zillion. So the polar bear behavior in the wild will probably disappear because it no longer can go and get seals out and, and, and eat them. So the polar bear is in zoos. There will probably be a, le a few left that, that feed on garbage dumps up, up, in, uh, up in the far north, but the behavior is going to be gone. The behavior is going to be gone, and that's going to affect these other three species. Because when a polar bear eats a seal, it picks it up and it shakes it around and it gets blood and guts, literally, everywhere. And so now the Ross gull, the ivory gull, and the arctic fox are all dependent upon those 
pits, bits of food that have been scattered around. Now, the Arctic fox has other things that it can eat, but the ivory gull and the Ross gull does not. And so what I am seeing now is that the Ross gull and the ivory gull also are functionally extinct. Okay, and now for the last one, the synergistic effects. This is the thing that I actually am very concerned about because we've been working oh, a zillion years trying to figure out how to worry about species um, when we have habitat modification and where do those species go. And now we have habitat modification, we have introduced species, we have all of these things going on, and on top of that we now have global warming. Now what, what could be going on? An example now is a, a colleague of mine, Camille Parmesan, did a beautiful study along the, the uh, Pacific Rim here looking at um, the Edith Bay checker spot butterfly. And she has found that it's moving north, just as we would expect. But there's a subpopulation down in Baja, California. It's moving up this way, but it's not going any farther north. Why is it not going any farther north? It's run into Tijuana and San Diego. So again, unless we go and try and save these, they're also not going to make it. So in general, well, a lot of us, do you guys remember the words of the prophets are, can you sing it? You could all sing it, couldn't you? <laughs> the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls. I promise I didn't do this. That was in a DC subway. <laughs> so I didn't do it. I promise I didn't do it. So hopefully part of what we can do and part of what we need to do is make Hummers socially unacceptable. <laughs> And so maybe in the future, what we can do is say, we're not certain why they disappeared, but archaeologists speculate that it has something to do with their size. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have time? We do have time, he says. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that you make this presentation to people who uh, don't heed uh, your words and have a different point of view. Uh, what's their reaction to this presentation? To this? The, the primary one is first, well, I've had people get up and leave, so that's one. Um, they will say that a lot of people now, are, the naysayers are saying, yes, it's warming, but it doesn't matter. And so I start telling them about how it's affecting species and crops and things like that. And they again say, I don't care about species. They just don't understand how much humans actually rely on those. So it's, it's really quite, quite striking. I, when I know that it's going to be a very, very hostile audience, I have two slides, actually three slides, that were taken from the, the great global warming swindle. Or is that what it was called? The, something like that. It was done in... in in um, the UK, and in there they have uh, a, a graph showing how sunspots and temperatures go all along, and then they stop and they say, that's now. Well, now happened to be in 1991. So I go ahead and plot out for these people, and I show, see, there's a divergence. So sunspots aren't doing it. And then I also have a, a plot that shows how they interpolated again uh, uh, along one of the plots, and they didn't know how to interpolate it, I guess. I mean, interpolation is a fairly straightforward thing. But what they did was they just went ahead and followed the, the curve of the sunspots, saying that that's what the temperature did. Well, so anyway, what, what I try to get across is, is that there really is global warming and it really is something important. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, uh, you're very knowledgeable. And um, we all know there are theories out on the movie. Yeah. Can you um, expound upon that? I know they're thinking viral, well, so they yeah. might just stop right everything was down to by yeah. us bacteria. Yeah. Um, and that's why the ocean is so important. But uh, would you? <clears throat> Well, what she was asking about is the honeybee, and the honeybee is primarily what's going on with the, the drop in the abundance of honeybees is, is primarily not having to do with global warming. It has more to do the, with the virus and the like. But now there's been a new study that's been done showing that they need to come up with a different kind of um, hive because it's sitting in the sun and it does make it harder for them to resist the virus. So there is that that connection, but it's not super, super strong. Mm. 
Go ahead. Um, yes, I wanted to know, um, it seems as though you've presented an enormous challenge in light of the fact that the world is going to continue warming. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, what I'm wondering is, you know, it's the job of many of us in the audience, myself included, to try to minimize but not eliminate that warming trend. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to ask you is, if we assume that we uh, can stabilize global temperature at, let's say, no more than plus two degrees C above pre-industrial, mm -hmm. what challenge does that leave the world's ornithologists and biologists to try to save species? Right. Um, what he was saying is if we, if we are able to stop and, and not have the, the globe go warmer than two degrees, uh, what will the results of that going to be to, to nature? And it's the IPCC, the third assessment report came out and said we are already having effects of nature. And then the fourth assessment report has already said too that with two degrees increase in, in warming, we are going to have between a 20 to a 30 percent um, extinction rate. And now, is that a problem or not? It really depends upon which species are going extinct. You can think about your computer. If you went through and randomly picked out 20 or 30 percent of the little gadgets that are all around, would it work? It might, but I don't think it would work very well. So that's, that's the issue. But we're still not going to be able to save these species because we don't have the political will, the money, the people, the land, on and on. Okay? Okay. I'm told to stop. Thank you very much.